Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. I am here, as always, with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, my friend. We had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Ken Kosick last week on the show. We are preparing for our follow-up conversation with Dr. Kosick today. You're going to lead us off, however, by sharing with us some information about a finger study that has nothing to do with fingers. Explain, please. Yes, great to be with you. And I can't wait to have our second conversation. But as we get ready to talk to Dr. Ken Kosick, I am very interested in talking to all of you about looking at dementia or Alzheimer's and having some innovative approaches and thoughts about management. And this study I'm going to share with you, which has uh, quite a bit of relevance with our conversation that's coming up. So in uh, 2015, a group of researchers published a study that was, you know, the acronym is FINGER, which stands for Finnish Geriatric Intervention Study to Prevent Cognitive Impairment and Disability. And in this study, more than 1,000 people participated, I think 1,200 people between the ages of 66 and 77 who were at high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And what they did is crafted this treatment intervention, which was centered around more nutritious and healthy eating habits, regular exercising, and engaging in intellectual pursuits. And what they found is at the end of the study, there was a significant change in these individuals. You know, they used a neuropsychological test batteries, including Stroop, uh, trail making tests, and they found that there was a 25% improvement in memory skills, problem solving skills. And even on the executive function measures, you know, Stroop being one of them, like working memory tests, those skills were 83% higher than at the start. What it did in um, collectively was delayed diagnosis of dementia by two years. So all these individuals were ide- already identified to be at high risk. And by making these changes, there was a substantial benefit that was shown. So I think it's very, very interesting that we have this wonderful study giving us hope And the reason I started off with this study for us to get into the discussion is because we are uh, really thinking about executive function and the continuum on the spectrum of life. So in the younger years, you need to understand how do children develop and how do they regulate themselves. And in older years, you are thinking about how to prevent the decline that's natural to aging and uh, still live a healthy and uh, full life. And to me, the common thread, um, so these are pearls on a string and the string is executive function. Executive function is how do you take charge of your life? How do you develop knowledge about yourself? How do you manage yourself? How do you recognize what tendencies you have? What kind of high risk factors that you um, you know come with? And how do you kind of really take charge of your life and bring upon change that's going to be essential. And that's why, you know, having this second conversation with our guest today, who is a very special friend of mine, as uh, you heard me talk to him last time, that's Dr. Kenneth Kosick. He has served as a professor at Harvard Medical School from 1996 to 2004, and after which he became the Harriman Professor and co-director of the Neuroscience Research Institute at University of California, Santa Barbara. He's a recipient of many, many, many awards, including a few that I'm going to name, which is Whitaker Health Science Award, a Milton Foundation Award, a Moore Award, Metropolitan Life Award, NASA Group Achievement Award uh, to Neural Lab Team, and finally, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, which is AAAS and Santa Barbara Innovation Star Award. So he is an exceptional researcher, educator, and a truly passionate individual who takes his work and and uses the lens of 
that artistic viewpoint about life is um, worth living and every uh, bit of work that we do using the scientific lens can really and should be uh, helping individuals live a better life. And he has co-authored two particular books, Outsmarting Alzheimer's Disease and Alzheimer's Solution, How Today's Care is Failing Millions and How Can We Do Better? And we will be discussing a lot about that today and his work, including the characterization in Colombia of the largest family in the world uh, with familial Alzheimer's has uh, appeared in many important publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, BBC, CNN, PBS, and CBS's 60 Minutes. And so it's a great pleasure for me to have this uh, second set of questions answered by him. And you're going to uh, certainly find it extremely helpful. I can promise you that. Well, I have a feeling that will be exactly the case. As we discussed last week, my mother is dealing with Alzheimer's. And so I am particularly interested in Dr. Kosick's comments about some things we might could do to help prevent it. So it promises to be a very, very important conversation. So let's get to it. Here is Suchita's second conversation with Dr. Ken Kosick. Welcome back to the podcast, Ken. I'm so delighted to have you. And thank you for sharing the framework last time so that we can understand the Alzheimer's disease. Today, I was hoping you can bring us some message of hope and we can get to the answers that people are looking for as to what to do once you have the disease or more importantly, what to do to prevent the occurrence of this disease. Before we jump into talking about Alzheimer's, I would love to touch upon uh, neuroplasticity. You know, that's a relatively uh, new idea in human biology. When I say new, that neuroplasticity is not new, but our understanding is new uh, with respect to cognition and neuroscience. But, you know, we know that brain is a remarkably resilient organ and harbors the capacity for self-healing. Do you mind talking to us a little bit about uh, what does neuroplasticity mean and how does this resiliency come into play when it comes to managing challenges as well as handling the cognitive load or difficulties of life mm -hmm. or all of it? <laughs> all of it. That's a big one. So brain plasticity, really what it means uh, fundamentally is that uh, the brain is able to change when we learn something. And by change, I mean, it makes new connections, its synapses can enlarge, genes get turned on. There's a lot of things that are going on in the brain that we can actually see and measure that are associated with learning something. When you learn it, there is a physical change in the brain that takes place at the cellular level. That's neuroplasticity in its most simple way. Now, neuroplasticity does allow us to perhaps uh, have be resilient because we have to adapt to many different situations. Everything around us is changing all the time, even um, in good ways and bad ways. You travel somewhere new on vacation, you have to learn your way around something. You have some sort of trauma. You have to figure out how to, to handle the trials of life all over again. You graduate from high school to college. Things are always changing for us. And that means there's this constant flow of novel information into the brain that has to be dealt with. So we generally you know, use the term resiliency to apply to how people handle difficult situations and keep going on. But really what people that are resilient are learning to do, what they are doing is learning how to handle something that changed. And that really is uh, neuroplasticity, what it comes down to. Wonderful. So is it fair to say then when someone's brain is undergoing these uh, radical changes with the brain plaques, that the very mechanism that allows you to adapt at a cellular level is less adaptive. And hence, uh, behaviorally, that person is not going to be able to adapt to the life's challenges. Precisely. So the brain is really a unique organ in that it, um, it has there's electrical activity that's going on. The brain is communicating by impulses, electrical impulses that are traveling in all these complex routes, different circuits, and those circuits are mediating everything we think and perceive and do. So when those circuits get gummed up with the amyloid and when cells in those circuits are being dropping out due to the tangles, there is less ability to learn, to do new things, neuroplasticity declines, and to some extent, I'm sure, 
resiliency declines as well. What what really um, what we see, for instance, in a person with Alzheimer's disease is another facet of um, what we were talking about in the other segment about uh, memory and the future. Uh, Alzheimer patients have uh, are impoverished in their ability to imagine the future. If you um, ask a kid or even a you know an adult, what are you going to do when you go to the beach this summer? The kid will go into detail about sandcastles and waves and all kinds of things about the, the, the ice cream vendors. There's many, many details that we fill in when we think about the future. Do you think you're, you know, as an adult, you're going to, to Paris, you really want to see a particular painting in the Louvre or, the, you know, Musée d'Or. You really can now visualize all of that. You ask an Alzheimer patient, well, what are your plans for the summer? They don't say much. They might say, well, I'll be at the beach. What are you going to do at the beach? There's not that richness of the ability to imagine the future. And that is also part of what is mediated by these vast numbers of synaptic connections. So is it that the synaptic connections start dimming down? That's why they begin to lose the capacity to imagine or it's the other way around or we can't tell? The synaptic connections are being lost as the primary problem. They, uh, there's stuff going on in the brain, the plaques, the tangles, other aspects, there's inflammation that's going on, and they are damaging the synapses. And a result of that, we're less able to perform. Got it. Got it. That makes perfect sense. So let's talk about this issue that our uh, society is facing. And, you know, as the baby boomers, baby boomer cohort moves forward (laughs) towards the age of risk, I believe that the researchers from researchers to policymakers everybody's concerned that there's potentially going to be a Alzheimer's epidemic. And do you think as a culture, are we prepared for it? No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, straightforward, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're, it's, it's very hard to prepare for this. We have to prepare in different ways. Um, we, we, there's um, the potential of bankrupting the, bankrupting the medical system because of the expense. Um, you know, it's, uh, Alzheimer's disease is... Yeah, you know, these estimates are rough, but people put the numbers in, you know, $250 billion a year to do all the caregiving and other support that's necessary. These, it's, it's hard to figure out how we're going to pay for it. It's hard to figure out how we're going to have uh, our families sort of have this burden upon us, uh, especially people that are in the so-called sandwich generation where they have to take care of their parents as well as their children. All of these factors are making the future look a little problematic unless we can figure out what to do. So why was this not a concern of ours as a society earlier? Is it because people are living longer or are we getting more afflicted with Alzheimer's disease or all of it? I think it's actually maybe, I don't, it may not be either of those. Uh, oh, I, I see. If you go back, gosh, now if you go back maybe... 40 years or 30 years or so, we had different words for these conditions. You might know the word senility. You might know the word hardening of the arteries. These were ways in which we could um, sort of put elders into a category that sort of allowed us to essentially disregard them. It really wasn't until the 70s that the knowledge became known, that, that, that we began to know that people who had you know, elders with these dementing illnesses actually had an illness. It wasn't that they were just getting old, which, is, which was one way to think about it. People just said, oh, you know, grandpa's old. Of course he does all that stuff. And now we see that that's an illness. So we never really categorized it as an illness, number one. Number two is that because of the baby boomer bubble moving into the age of risk that is also contributing to the epidemic. I see. Oh, yeah, that I I think that really speaks to my heart that I think, uh, you know, I see that with so many developmental disorders that children suffer from, that we have stopped labeling it as a child being difficult or uncooperative or just not worthy of receiving education or support. But we are beginning to understand that it's actually a anomaly, a difficulty in developing these abilities, just like Alzheimer's is a disease. This is a developmental disorder. So I'm happy to see that as a culture, we are becoming more sensitive and knowledgeable. So let's talk about the Alzheimer's disease and its treatment. Can you tell us how should we think about it? 
Do we begin to think about uh, the disease uh, or treating the disease once we know we have a disease or should we look at it before we develop the disease or do we do both? How do we best go about it? Well, Alzheimer's disease is very common. So number one is very common. And number two is we currently do not have a treatment that's very, any treatment that's effective. So given that information, we really think, I really think, most people think that prevention is the most important thing we can do. But prevention is not quite the right word because if I give you a vaccine for measles, I'm going to prevent measles. But no matter what we do, I can't promise you that we're going to prevent Alzheimer's disease. All I can say to you is that if you follow a prevention regimen, which we can talk about, you will reduce your risk. And that is, that's the best we can do right now. But because Alzheimer's is so serious, we really ought to do it. We could have, if everybody followed a prevention or a decreased risk regimen, we could have a very big impact on the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in the world. So it's probably worth saying a word about what a prevention or a a decreased risk regimen would look like. Well, before we talk about that, can you quickly tell us what are the risk factors for somebody to develop Alzheimer's? I think like from a medical point of view as well as the lifestyle point of view. Yes. So the risk factors that we know about go hand in hand with the treatments that I'm going to also talk about, because for every risk factor, we want to say, what can you do about it? So I'll talk about them a little bit together here. The greatest risk factor is one that we can't do anything about, and that's aging. But after that, there is a lot of things that we can do. And they fall into two categories. One are what we might call medical risks, and I'll talk about what they are in a moment. And the other are what we might call lifestyle risks, which I'll also talk about. So for medical risks, we have by far and away the number one risk is elevated blood pressure. And in fact, if you've read the news just today, a very major study has been completed that has really now for the first time completely confirmed the fact that elevated blood pressure is a risk for dementia. We sort of knew it before, but we didn't know it well enough to really try to intervene as a, at a national level, and now we do. So you have to know your numbers. You should, you should have your blood pressure taken regularly, and people should get a blood pressure cuff in their home so they can actually track their blood pressure and not rely on having to go into a drugstore where they may have a defective cuff or wait till you see your doctor. So, Ken, it's interesting you say that because from my work with strokes, you know, we for years uh, had heard that cardiovascular, you know, higher blood pressure and its relationship with cardiovascular diseases and then its correlation to stroke was always talked about, but there was never a conversation about Alzheimer's disease. That's Uh, absolutely right. And now we really realize that the risk factors for cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease greatly overlap. That's a big insight. Wow. So as we go down through the medical risks, these are, and these are very important to know because just like blood pressure, the other ones I'll tell you are also treatable. There are, there's good blood pressure medication. You can get your blood pressure under control. Most people can pretty easily. Risk number two is if your lipid profile is abnormal. Cholesterol is high, you know, whether it's uh, your different HDL, LDLs, all these numbers, uh, triglycerides. If they are in the abnormal range, your risk goes up. The data is not as good as it is for blood pressure, but lipid disorders are very, very treatable. And most people in this field would recommend that you treat it if you have an abnormal level of a, in your lipid profile. That would be number two. And number three, these are all numbers, very easy. The third one is to follow your glucose. That is, if you have, you have a diabetic tendency, your fasting glucose is over 100. Some people want to say even over 90, but say over 100 then you should do something about it. That can be losing some weight, taking some medications, but high glucose, high lipids, high blood pressure are all medical risks for Alzheimer's disease, and every single one of them can be treated. If we treated them, this we would really make a dent on this problem. 
So Ken, how do we think about drug and alcohol use and how does that relate to Alzheimer's disease? Well, I assume that you're when you talk about drugs, you're talking about drugs, everything from marijuana to everything. Drugs. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. So so there's no evidence that drugs or alcohol will increase your risk for Alzheimer's. They're not good. They increase your risk for a lot of things, including uh, perhaps other forms of dementia. There are dementing illnesses associated with a lot of alcohol consumption. It's, uh, it's not, none of that stuff is good, but I can't put it on the list for an Alzheimer risk. Okay. So now what about the next set of uh, risk factors? Yeah. So now we're going to go over to lifestyle. And here we can again put one lifestyle factor at the top of the list. It's like higher than all the others I'll talk about. The data is it's the best data. And you can do something to change your lifestyle around this concept. You might already guess what it is. Exercise. Exercise. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, you sound like you weren't so pleased. With that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if I'm going to develop dementia just simply by hearing you say exercise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let it be an incentive for you to, uh, to think about how to do some exercise. The Exercise is good to try to reduce your risk for many diseases, including Alzheimer's. The data, as I say, data is pretty good. And then there's some questions that naturally follow. Like you might say, well, how much exercise? What type of exercise? All of those things are questions that are still not precisely answered. But it's pretty clear that um, if you can get some exercise in every day or most days, even if it's only brisk walking, that you're really going to um, help your future. Now, some people, and this is modifiable, we can do something about it. But for some people, it may be difficult. Maybe they get a little dizzy. Maybe they have a bad knee. Maybe they're not motivated. So I think this is a role where getting some help can really be useful. Either a, you know, if uh, you can afford it, a personal trainer, physical therapist for if there's knee trouble, or joining a group. Of people that are that in which you use peer pressure to keep you going. But exercise is really important. Number one. As we go down the list, the another one that has gotten a bit of attention, and there is good data for it, is your diet. People have given a lot of attention to a Mediterranean diet as being uh, as as a risk reduction diet. I think the data is pretty good, but I'm sure that a Mediterranean diet is not the only way to do it. There are other diets that are high in antioxidants, high in vegetables, low in a lot of fatty stuff, and those diets are probably also good. They just don't have the, we just don't have as many studies. So if you want to take uh, like a take-home message here uh, that's easy, I would simply suggest that just watch calories, stay away from fast foods, and Take it from there. I mean, that is really probably the key message in the area of diet. You know, it's so interesting. I think what I love about uh, this message, it is beneficial now and it, it's beneficial in the future. So if you exercise and if you eat well, you will reap the benefits as you live it. It's not like, you know, when I save in two years, I'll be able to buy a house. When you save today, you'll be able to buy a house today. You know, it's that kind of benefit that you're going to uh, see. So people should be really, really jazzed up about preventing Alzheimer's. <laughs> I agree with you. I completely agree with you. And just to put a, a little plug in here, maybe I shouldn't be doing that, but you know, there's lots of books out on this. I have one of them. It's called Outsmarting Alzheimer's Disease, which lays out all of these, uh, these things that can be done, the lifestyle and the medical things that uh, you can pay attention to and decrease your risk. And I texted you a picture of uh, that book that I was reading in my library in the house you saw with my my little dog on our sofa chair but I've been carrying that book uh, this whole week and reading I mean I had not thought about that book for myself uh, but now that I was getting ready to interview so I've been, I've been reading and I was wondering if uh, you know I took it to my hair salon and I wondered if people around me uh, are thinking that my god she's afraid of developing dementia. She must have some signs of it or something. But I highly, highly recommend that book. I will be uh, putting out all the information about your book on 
and we'll have a link on our website. But uh, Ken, I think that was the most incredible book I have read in a while that comprehensively talks. And particularly as a scientist, when you endorse lifestyle, to me, I just feel it so validates the uh, the marriage between uh, art and science. Because taking care of life, uh, you know, how much ever knowledge you have about facts and details, it comes down to implementation and the emotions that go into uh, making changes to yourself or to your lifestyle. But we have to do it by keeping the future in mind. So I really appreciated the way you have organized and laid out all the details. I have a question in closing. Can you quickly talk about sleep and how does sleep fit into all this? I see technology really creating so many roadblocks for us. People just don't, they're taking, uh, we never took a television to our bed, you know, but we are taking our phones to our bed. We are, you know, in the glowing in the dark and we just don't have any, we have incessant contact uh, with information and the world. And I, I wonder if that's going to make us, you know, affect our attention, affect our working memory and uh, any thoughts about that? I do. And in fact, um, on the list of lifestyle things that I, I'll mention, I'll mention that. Let me go into a little bit of depth on that one. Let me just, uh, so we just make it comprehensive. Let me just mention the other lifestyle factors very quickly. Uh, in addition to exercise and uh, good diet, you uh, you want to avoid long-term chronic stress. It's easier said than done. We can talk about that as well. People want to have uh, avoid social isolation. Having friends is good for the brain. We can talk more about that. Having cognitive challenges, that doesn't just necessarily mean doing the same New York Times crossword puzzle you've been doing for the last two decades. It means new cognitive challenges like learning a language or playing a musical instrument, traveling. These are all things to do. But you asked specifically about sleep, which is also on that list. And again, the evidence is really growing that having a good night's sleep is also good for the brain. I think that, that when I talk to patients about that, it's really um, a mixed message because you can sometimes by telling people about that, and they should know about it, but by telling people about that, you then can sometimes set up this anxiety like, oh, I've got to fall asleep. I've got to fall asleep. I can't sleep, you know, and I'm going to be damaging my brain because I've been lying here awake. You, you Sleep is a physiological thing, and it's very hard to make yourself do it. And if you worry a lot about it, then you can be sometimes making it harder. On the other hand, you pointed out some real serious, typical sleep interrupters that are things we can do something about. Turning off your cell phone at night, you know, even if I turn mine off, I can still hear it vibrate on the night table. So it has to be in another room. You know, it's really um, important to try to do everything. You know, don't have coffee before bed. There's a lot of things we can do to enhance the likelihood of getting a good night's sleep. But I don't think people want to go so far as to say that, oh, I'm not getting the typical seven, eight hours and I need, and I'm going to start creating all kinds of anxiety. You really want to titrate the amount of sleep you need, which is different in all of us, and the quality of the sleep you're getting. Mm, wow. I think I need to consider the quality of my sleep. You know, I, I'm even when I'm awake in the morning, I don't quickly, swiftly get out of bed. I begin my business of checking emails in bed. So I need to have some good habits, like instead start exercising. Uh, in closing, you did mention one of the very important effective steps, which was to d try and develop a circle of friends. Can you talk a little bit about that having bearing on uh, preventing or postponing delaying Alzheimer's disease? Sure. People may not see the connection, actually. Yeah. Well, in this case, it's uh, simply a correlation that people with friends tend to live longer, have healthier lives, don't get as much Alzheimer's. We don't know if it's cause and effect. Maybe that people that have lots of friends uh, and have an active social life are just predisposed to do that in the same way they're protected from Alzheimer's disease. We don't know if you suddenly go out and make a lot of friends if you're necessarily going to reduce your risk. But it is a fact that people with friends are, uh, and avoiding social, social isolation, are somewhat protected from dementia. And uh, I think that it makes sense to me. I can't give you a deep neurobiological reason for why it's true. 
other than the fact that human beings are just inherently social animals and to deprive ourselves of friendships, social interactions is going against who we are. You know, it, it, what thought comes to my mind is, you know, one of the items that you mentioned, which is tease your brain with cognitive activity or challenge. Socializing is a one of the most deeply provocative process of challenging your brain process. It's You have to theorize the minds of others. You have to predict and anticipate what others are thinking. You have to adjust and self-control, exercise self-control with relationship to others. And more importantly, interacting with people is one thing, but forming friendship and social bond requires a lot of self-sacrificing gestures, which requires that self-regulation. And to me, that exercising self-regulation is, again, sounds like uh, you're bringing that prefrontal system on. And so that practice may also strengthen some of these connections in the brain. I don't know, but that's kind of a thought that came to my mind. I totally agree with you. (laughs) So with that, Ken, this was such a delightful conversation. And I really thank you for giving us a detailed outline and laying down these very important and sometimes often dismissed to have, uh, you know, these these steps that you mentioned, for example, an ordinary, you know, in an ordinary day, we may dismiss its value, but it's such a, has a profound long-term impact. So I really appreciate you um, uh, helping us see through the science uh, eventually connecting to um, the art of living. So thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing your knowledge. And it's been a great, great joy talking with you. Thank you very much too. Bye-bye. All right. So that was Dr. Ken Kosick. That was your second conversation with him, Sucheta. Wow. Particularly from someone like me who's dealing with a mother with Alzheimer's and worried about my future. (laughs) What an important conversation that was. Lead us off with uh, some of your initial thoughts, however. It really was a very helpful to have this conversation. And you and I have had a lot of offline conversations about what you're dealing with. So I am hoping that, uh, you know, this gave you a lot of food for thought as well. And I don't think you're alone in this uh, worry about your brain. And just as I am worried about my brain, you know, giving me (laughs) the support and partnership uh, until the end of life. Uh, A few thoughts that I think uh, that make sense to me is the relationship between neuroplasticity and resilience. You know, the brain plasticity as Uh, Ken was defining it, that it's the brain's capacity to change when we are exposed to opportunities for learning. And uh, when we experience something new and familiar and difficult, we are changing the way brain is responding to those opportunities. And that's nothing but the plasticity. And these brain changes are not just hypothetical or proposed, but they are measurable and tangible. You know, there's more current uh, that flows uh, through the nerve cells as uh, one is exposed to unfamiliar and difficult tasks and is navigating that learning opportunity. Genes, as uh, he was talking about, genes get turned on, synapses enlarge, and there are actual cellular changes which become evident upon observation. So it's a real thing and it's something that we can take advantage of. Uh, resiliency, you know, and I have had experts like uh, Sam Goldstein and Robert Brooks, who are experts in concept of resiliency. And that's self-evident as the brain navigates the incoming flood of novel information and begins to make sense or impose order by formulating a plan to deal with it. So having an intentional engagement with something that was not anticipated through resiliency, including mindset and including cognitive thought process, you are handling it. And as you adapt and adjust, you are really changing the way brain is wired. And so that's the relationship between the two. And so what we are looking here is for one's capacity to handle the cognitive load, adapt and shift successfully in order to yield success, joy, and a sense of equilibrium, being in uh, in a state of uh, equanimity as you are finding and navigating yourself. So what I really think that um, at heart of, um, you know, helping people cope, whether it's a disability or a disorder or a disease, uh, one must really, really keep uh, resiliency in the center of it. Well, in discussing resiliency, I mean, I, I suspect it should be obvious that brains with Alzheimer's are not as resilient as others, right? 
Yeah, because we we discussed this last time. So it's not a matter of will when it comes to Alzheimer's. That means why don't you stop being forgetful? You know, we can't really say that to a person with Alzheimer's. You know, the ability to actually, uh, that there's a genuine decline in the uh, brain function. You know, the ability to imagine the future escapes uh, these brains uh, who are fighting with the, uh, fighting Alzheimer's. And so such uh, impoverished brains lack the strength to imagine different outcomes for self, but that uh, originates in the, the changed brain chemistry or synaptic junctions and the way neurons are structured. So these, there is a structural change at the brain level. And so the impact of that is the one's own capacity to understand your condition and then also one's own ability to affect the future by imagining it uh, with the, the richness and texture that's essential to the vitality for the uh, one's um, emotional and cognitive landscape, so to speak. And so at the brain level, there's a decline electric exchange there's diminished activity in the brain and fading of synaptic connections. And all that, of course, affects the health of the brain. And a less wired brain is likely to experience a lot of setback because it then is not able to be as resilient and be able to kind of imagine alternatives because those alternatives is having a communication between different parts of the brain that's taking over. So some of that may be really uh, lacking. So the important thing is then once these changes set in, you can't really focus on building the brain or, or revitalizing the memory skills or preventing the disease from then that point on, but really helping people or the loved ones to live a life of meaning and maintaining joy when you meet with them. So just a thought in terms of uh, how do we view this, you know, there are people who are dealing with the loved ones and are trying to see how to connect and how to support. And it's a big financial burden and it is also a social emotional burden. But what I found a recent a story in the Atlantic, which was very encouraging, you know, there's a, in Holland, outside Amsterdam, in a small town of Weeps, a Weisp, I think, Weisp, uh, there's something called Dementia Village. And uh, I just, I was reading about it and it was so fascinating and I've now obsessively watched a lot of videos about how actually the village works. Uh, but it's a, a cutting edge elder, elderly care facility that houses around 152 residents. They have their own theater, garden, post office, restaurant, and even a town square. And all members of the village are individuals with Alzheimer's and their disease has progressed significantly. So it's not a kind of a, a elderly um, home or community, but it's actually for those who are suffering for uh, with dementia. And I think what's so fascinating about the way they are doing it is, you know, they have built a community, the community that takes care of the elderly by the elderly having a role and responsibility in their community. So if you want to shop, you can actually go to the grocery store, you can actually have dinner at a restaurant, but it's all part of the nursing care facility. And the results are outstanding. It shows that the clients who belong to this village require uh, far less medication. They tend to eat better. They, uh, in fact, tend to live longer and uh, they uh, seem to have much more happier lives or reporting joy compared to the standard elderly care facilities anywhere else. And it's a remarkable approach to me as um, once we have identified the disease and once we know that we are not looking at the individual with Alzheimer's going back to developing memory skills so that they don't forget anymore. We are only going to now look at either preventing the decline of memory skills and, and skills that go into be living an independent life, but continuing to have meaning. So it was an outstanding example of uh, one can do it well. Yeah, no, I'm anxious to learn more about that community. Uh, spending so much time with my mother's uh, uh, facility, which is uh, an assisted living facility that's obviously catered to memory care. And I love the commentary around joy because I look at my life and my role with my mother in terms of looking at it through one lens. And my job is merely this. It's to create as many small moments of joy as I can. And that's all we can do. So lots to think about there. So we did talk a lot about prevention and treatment. So how how should we view those two? Yeah, so I think the 
again, treatment is using a disease model. And we just saw the example of using a lifestyle model once the disease uh, the the individual is diagnosed with disease, but there is another way to look at it is which is prevention. So the lens on management should be lowering the risk of developing Alzheimer's rather than preventing the disease because we really don't have a way to know other than having higher risk factors. We really don't know um, how it uh, develops and progresses. So what we can do is with the age of risk on the horizon, uh, it really is important that we all look at having a healthy lifestyle. And particularly in, in uh, Ken's book, uh, Outsmarting Alzheimer's, he talks about something called SMARTS curriculum. And uh, his protocol is S is stands for social smarts, M st stands for uh, meal smarts, A stands for aerobic smarts, R stands for resilience smarts, and uh, T stands for train your brain smarts. And finally, the S stands for sleep smarts. And so each individual strand, he goes in depth and gives recommendations how to do it. But I think there's a way to understand your own relationship to your brain and, you know, treating your brain and body with great respect and taking all the care that we need to do. It's literally analogous to saving money. So instead of just focusing on saving money for your old age, how about kind of saving your cognitive funds for having a better brain life. So just to go into some of the habits that he talked about, but using this SMARTS acronym, I think the social SMARTS, for example, as a preventative method is for us to cultivate uh, socializing skills, you know, uh, throwing parties, getting um, uh, organizing uh, community events, participating in discussion or book clubs, uh, film clubs, connecting and building communities, going and volunteering, you know, sharing interest or getting together with people that you have similar interests. So those kinds of socializing or building a social, robust social life can be, uh, can inoculate uh, your brain from experiencing decline. The second was the meal smarts, you know, talking about uh, healthy eating habits, you know, simply, I think even reducing the intake of um, high calorie and unsavory foods that are not uh, <laughs> good for your body's chemistry. I mean, myself, I'm a vegetarian uh, at best, try to be gluten-free and dairy-free and sugar-free as often as possible and kind of eating in small portions and spacing out meals and really keeping 12-hour fasting. Some of these habits I have picked up simply by understanding the thinking brain and how to keep it robust in thinking. The aerobic smarts, which is the biggest struggle for me, is to exercise regularly. But just even 30 minutes of um, you know, walking or keeping your body in motion has shown to have lost, uh, very you know, strong results. I read recently that sitting is new smoking, I guess, or smoking of 21st century. So we have all become technology centric. And so I myself have gotten a walking desk, which is it's a treadmill and the, there's a standing desk on top of it. And I try to be on it in the evenings, particularly, and avoid slouching in the sofa as I'm still working. And last three items are like resilience smarts is um, having a life of purpose, you know, developing some sense of purpose, some sense of bringing, uh, making a difference in lives of others, having some central kind of thread that runs through your life where you have found a connection to the larger meaning. And, you know, in previous podcasts, uh, Todd, uh, you and I uh, kind of heard Dr. Pitchell talk about this, you know, often when our plate is full and we don't have the best management skills, we tend to get into this existential crisis. Why should I do this? Why does this matter? And again, I think in that, uh, those podcasts, I also talked about bringing purpose back. And this is, again, at the tail end of life, having subscribed to that principle of meaningful life can bring great joy, even as you age. And then training your brain. And that's what I specialize in. You know, I was just recently, um, I just uh, saw an Instagram post today that, you know, talked about communication. You know, it's, it's an international communication project. And one of the things that they talked about was there are 7,099 languages that are spoken in the world. And imagine uh, one of the ways you can challenge your brain or train your brain is to learn a language. And I myself speak five languages and I have found that to be so, so helpful in 
uh, code switching and linguistic switching when I'm with different groups. And I always uh, tell my children how they don't have that kind of advantage simply by not growing up in India. You know, me speaking five languages, nothing spectacular, by the way. And lastly, I know sleep matters. I think, um, you know, kind of developing good hygiene around sleep can also allow your brain to restore itself and just do the uh, healing and the hidden work that the brain does at night to consolidate memory and to also revitalize our attention for the next day. So these are some of the things that I think were outstanding in our conversation that are also very well described in his book. And I think we should really plan (laughs) to uh, better our lives using those principles. Nothing spectacular about speaking five languages, she says. Some would argue I can't even speak English very well. So goodness gracious. So thank you for going through those. uh, We should be doing those kinds of things anyway, but uh, it's particularly gratifying to know that that can have real positive impact on your brain health. So good stuff there. So, Sujeta, before we go, any uh, any closing remarks you want to share? Sure. You know, over these two episodes, we discussed fear of developing Alzheimer's, uh, devastating effects of the disease on an individual and their families, and ways to manage once someone has the disease versus ways to live a life so that we can prevent the disease. The question is, how does this all relate to executive function, which is the topic of this podcast? And that takes me back to defining executive function. So executive function is your capacity and ability to orchestrate your life by taking charge of your own self, by understanding self, by connecting your actions to the goals you have for yourself and monitoring yourself through passage of time. And so there are a lot of barriers to um, living a fulfilling life with respect to executive function because you may not have the motivation that is essential for it. We may not have good insight into self or we may not have what it takes to really sustain your effort throughout the passage of time. So really, we have to keep connecting our current day to our future selves. And talking about Alzheimer's, it's one thing to be in your old age and have the diagnosis and then kind of work from there on. But leading up to it, even you may be 25 years old, you may be 36 years old, or you may be 52 years old. How do you kind of live a robust mental and physical life that will afford you all the resilience and inoculate you from a decline that can affect your brain? And so kind of a really important part of that goes into that self-management. So preventing future diseases require deep connection to that future self, as I was saying, and that also requires executive function skills. We had a Hal Hirschfield on our show who talked about that difficulty connecting emotionally or cognitively to that future self or psychologically to that future self. Our capacity to imagine a future self from now till 10 years or next 20 years, how would I look? How would I feel? How, what will I be capable of doing? We just do not have that capacity as well built as a capacity to imagine ourselves in maybe less next six months. So understanding that about ourselves is really, really important. So to develop lifestyle changes, one must have great self-knowledge. And that's, uh, you know, know thyself principle requires possessing strong executive function skills. And that requires a key, key component, which is delaying gratification. So whether it's not eating fast food, whether um, uh, stopping yourself from watching, uh, binge watching and getting on the treadmill instead. You know, last couple of episodes, we talked about that procrastination. So knowing something, you're supposed to do something, but not wanting to do that. And so those that short-sightedness is the biggest reason we may get ourselves in a pickle. So there's growing evidence that not just good habits, but brain healthy habits can go long ways. And how do we develop them is by moderation or self-control. We need to have future in mind, become less future blind or current self-centric. We must work on reducing stress and better manage anxiety-ridden days that we encounter on a daily basis. And we need to work on diminishing procrastination. And finally, I think we need to live a life of purpose. And Together, I think we can shift our thought process from that preoccupation with the 
disease and prevent, uh, I mean, managing disease, but more building cognitive savings for the future self by taking on novel, challenging and relevant, difficult tasks on a daily basis to tease the brain to become very strong and healthy and be able to bounce back from challenges with great resolve and consistency. And that's what is going to prevent future decline in our brain skills. Using executive functions is what it's going to do, help us. Well, two very impactful interviews with Dr. Kim Kosick Sucheda. And if you don't mind me saying this, after that second interview, we had uh, some post-show banter with him. And I asked him the point blank question, when will we have a cure for Alzheimer's? And he was optimistic that we would likely have a cure within a generation. So we're optimistic and hopeful for that day. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. On behalf of our host, Sucheta Kamath, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thank you for listening and tuning in today. And we look forward to seeing you again right here next week on Full Prefrontal. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at cerebralmatters.com. Dot com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.